Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I've come to the United States straight out of a place called Wayanad in Kerala, a very rich district until two years ago, one of the richest districts in the state of Kerala, in which agriculture has collapsed, and there have been at least over, over 150 farmers' suicides since January last year. At the same time, in the urban metro of uh, Delhi, at the, about the time I left, and in fact a little before I left, was a celebration of, a, was a, an activity of a different kind. On the one hand, you had these farmers committing suicide in extreme distress. On the other hand, we were witnessing a phenomenon that is about three to five years old now, theme weddings. A theme wedding is where you take about an acre or two for, of land and put up a replica of a great monument, maybe the Taj Mahal, maybe the Sistine Chapel, if it's a Bengali wedding, uh, even Kargil as a theme, and you spend millions and millions of rupees to put up a structure which is going to last 12 hours and then be dismantled after the wedding so as to ensure you exclusivity for your theme. So this can cost millions of rupees, in fact tens of millions of rupees, because I think the last one, one of the biggest was three crores, that's about 30 million rupees, is spent in creating this theme wedding. So on the one hand, you had these farmers committing suicide in extreme distress. On the other, you had this unbelievable display of opulence and wealth. But we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that story. I'm coming in from Seattle, where I noticed that the tsunami still makes front page. And that's as good a starting point as any. It's right here on the front page, carries over. There's more than a page, full page of tsunami stories in this. And I think it's a good starting point for our discussion tonight um, on inequality and the things you don't get to know from your media. Just let's take the tsunami. Now, all of us know that the tsunami struck on, uh, and it, the stories you don't get to know, even if they do appear minorly in the press somewhere, give you a very different picture of the world functioning around the tsunami. Now, every one of us knows that the tsunami struck on December 26th, devastated 11 nations, 200,000 human beings died, um, 160,000 of them in five countries. And uh, we know about the outpouring of generosity, etc., etc. Here's something perhaps that most people don't know. Of the 11 nations devastated by the tsunami, Five, only five, have anything approaching major stock exchanges. Five countries of the 11 have major stock exchanges. These are India, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, and Sri Lanka. Here's the news. Within 72 hours of the tsunami striking, as it became clear that the damage was phenomenal, every one of these five stock exchanges reached their historic high. Every one of these stock exchanges, the sensitive index went through the roof. The more the misery, the better the stock exchange did. The biggest records were set by the Indonesian, by the Jakarta Stock Exchange, where the maximum number of people, in a country where the maximum number of people died. The Sensex, the sensitive index of the Bombay Stock Exchange, reached an all-time high by January 3rd, when it was absolutely clear that the tsunami had been devastating in its impact. The JSX of Indonesia crossed one historic high after another. Every day it reached a different level. The SETI, the SCTI of Thailand, the stock exchange of Bangkok, was higher than at any point it had been between 1997 and 2003. The KLSC, the Kuala Lumpur Stock Exchange of, uh, the Mala of Malaysia, reached its highest in five years. And the CSE, the all-share index of the Sri Lankan uh, Stock Exchange, clocked in at about 16 points below 
its highest ever since it was founded. Now, if it had happened with one stock exchange, coincidence, all five, the worst five affected countries have the best performing stock exchanges. What conclusion do we draw from it? Well, one conclusion that you can draw from it, though paradoxically it doesn't apply in this case, one conclusion is generally true. The majority of those hit by the tsunami were trivial and meaningless to the stock markets. Yet, they were meaningful enough to send the stock markets through the roof. How did that happen and why? The people affected were fi mainly fisher folk, poor people, domestic servants, people crowded into poor quarters along the coast. So they don't, many of them have absolutely no participation in the stock markets. So to that extent, they're marginal and trivial to the functioning of markets. However, the stock markets of our time also represent the interests of those who make money out of grief. The sense that sent the markets soaring was the smell of reconstruction dollars coming in. So the greater the misery, the greater the dollars, the greater the dollars, the better the stock exchange did. No coincidences. You can play that for one, one stock exchange, not for the five stock exchanges of the five worst affected countries, affected countries. One of the great successes of, uh, one of the great successes of economists and economics in the last 20 years is that we've completely divorced how, econom how economies are doing from how people are doing. Econ economies can boom while people sink. And we've made stock markets central indicators of how economies and nations are doing. By that yardstick, the greater the misery of the people, the greater the uh, misery of those hit by the tsunami, the better the stock markets did. And the better the stock markets did, the better the nation is doing, because it's a central indicator of how national economies are doing. So the more miserable the poor, the better the countries are doing. In fact, I think it's a perfect metaphor of what's really happening in the world. Consider that the same sensitive index of the Bombay Stock Exchange, the Sensex, in May 2004, at the moment of the greatest triumph of the Indian people, when an electorate of 600 million voters showed the world what democracy was about, going to the polls in orderly democratic fashion, and actually we know how to run elections, and uh, some countries still do, and 600, an electorate of 600 million people went out and against the predictions, the desires, the desperate desires of the Indian elite, the uh, upper middle classes, every single opinion poll, exit poll, the intellectual elite, the pundits of the, ch the, pundits of the television channels, just annihilated the government they did not want just did it against all the predictions and against every against the majority of the editorials in the newspapers which took for granted that the government was going to return to power that was the greatest moment of triumph of the indian people what happened the stock market collapsed to its worst position in many many years at the point when the indian people scored their greatest triumph the stock market collapsed at a time of enormous misery of the poor the stock market reached its historic high, crossing 6,600 on the sensitive index for the first time. That's why I call, the sense, I call the Sensex the misery index. It operates in inverse proportion to the happiness of the greatest happiness of the greatest number.